already got her PowerPoint up. Yes, okay. good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, folks, I want to introduce to you uh, Dr. Frances Stetson. Uh, she has, I think, been presenting uh, for us at this uh, academy for at least the beginning, I believe, about four I years ago. So yes, um, you're right. Yeah, she, she is going to talk to us today about the inclusive practices, action planning. In fact, I think um, you were the one that actually did the uh, self-assessment uh, tool Correct. for our schools. Yeah. And uh, she has also uh, done some modules that are actually posted on DOE's website um, in regards to inclusive practices. So um, take it away, Dr. Stetson. All right, thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of anything that the Virginia Department of Education sponsors. I, uh, I, I have to say you're my second favorite state and I only have to say you're my second only because uh, I live and my family lives in Texas, but uh, I, I really have been impressed with everything that you all have done. You're very, very thoughtful in your work toward inclusive practices. You, you have adopted the self-assessment instrument so you know where you are and what you need to do to improve and what you need to celebrate. And so it's always a pleasure to join you. Um, the uh, session that we have today is um, kind of reinforces something that occurs to me frequently when working with teams around inclusive practices. The minute that you've completed that self-assessment on inclusive schools, um, the natural next step is to develop an action plan and hopefully a very robust action plan uh, so that you really do begin to see changes in, in percentages, numbers, and opportunities for children to be included successfully. And so one of the things that um, I have, I wanted to share this wonderful quote from John, John F. Kennedy. I love it because he says there are risk and cost to action. Sure. You know, you can, you can blast out and, and take an action, but, uh, and sometimes, and most of the time we're really happy with it. And I have to say, occasionally we, we might regret racing ahead, but he says there are far less risk than the long range risk of comfortable inaction. I love that phrase. Um, when we conduct our step by step training and inclusion, often all the teams are really engaged and involved. And then boom, we get to the part where we develop the action plan and we just sort of go, oh, okay, let's see. Well, so we'll conduct some professional development on inclusion and uh, then we'll meet back in a year and see how we're doing. So. Uh, I wanted to to we're gonna we're gonna give you lots of different strategies that you can embed in your own action plan that uh, hopefully will help you uh, really close the gap in terms of achievement, but also uh, to increase those in, uh, percentages of youngsters with disabilities who are included in the general education classroom and the curriculum. So you all recognize what I put on the screen, and I have. Um, uh, then embedded uh, the first page of the, the, the assessment tool itself. And so today we're working right here in this column where you're, you certainly, uh, as you know, when you, when you complete the self-assessment, you're asked to review each of the practices and to say, is it in place? Should it be improved or is it not in place at all? And then you place your action steps. And then it's up to you to say, when will you start end, and what's your evidence of success? So the entire um, work that we're going to do today together is around this column right here. What are the things that we can do that make a difference? So I want to tell you that you have two resources in your, in your, in your link. One of them is this document right here, and this is the one we're going to follow. This has all the text that you need in order to, to, to recognize the steps that we're recommending for each of the components or indicators. So you see this first one is the clear and consistent vision and vocabulary. And we have bulleted several strategies that we recommend that would really be the most helpful. Off to, um, to the side under the resources column, those are active links to tools that you will find helpful. And then um, one of the things that we'll do as we move forward is that we're going to put a bow around this and talk about how this all fits back into that action plan. So 
The second thing that I've given you is I, um, I was thinking while I we were listening to Dr. Lucas present that you would probably benefit perhaps from having the PowerPoint uh, that I'm going to use now because of uh, when you present to your teams uh, in your schools about how you will develop an action plan, you might find some of this helpful. So, um, so you're going to have both. And with that said, how I'm going to start is that each one of these um, uh, has, the, has the component, and this is the first one again, the clear and consistent vision. And then I wanted to just place a, I guess, a, um, a piece here that, a comment that I would make at the beginning of each of these different components and why it's so important or why are we spending our time with this? And so I, it's been my experience for a very long time. And when we evaluate districts around the country at their request to come in and see how they're doing is that in very often the school doesn't have a clear vision and vocabulary around inclusion. And if there's not that, then there is perhaps even chaos in, in the district uh, because one school has a philosophy, the child moves from that elementary school and goes on to the middle school and there's a different philosophy, a different vocabulary uh, and so on. So it's very critical that we develop some level of commonality across our district with regard to the options on the continuum and, and the way that we look at inclusive practices. So that's why, that's how it's that important. So I'm gonna move ahead then, and I'm going to, um, to begin, and you have the parallel either presentation or that uh, printed, um, I call it a table, that has the strategies that you can use as well. All right, one of the first things that we like to recommend doing is to gain the information about what, what your staff perspectives are and uh, that we, uh, about inclusive practices. That helps you tremendously. You're going to know right off the bat, do you have issues? Or are you going to have to really double down and work on the atti attitudes toward inclusion? Or is almost everyone with you? And then, of course, uh, I recommend, by the way, that this uh, survey that we're going to give you is anonymous because you want to have everyone's absolute honest opinions about the practice. But you also um, might suggest that if anybody differed from the positions in the survey, they should come and talk to you as a principal or a, or a team. So it's important to get that baseline data. Where is our faculty now? And so you can repeat that after a year or two every, and every year, every two years, if you want to, so that you move ahead and see how, what progress have we made. And then it helps you adjust your action steps so that you're really more focused on, on what really will make a difference to the faculty. In fact, I would have an open-ended question at some point in this survey. Now here is the, um, oops, here is the, uh, a snapshot for you. And every time that I share with you a strategy, I'm going to, for the most part, have a tool for you. So here is a tool that you can put online, again, anonymous, but uh, ask for position. And then uh, here are the questions, strongly agree to strongly disagree. Now look at question number four, for example. This is a perfect one. Faculty members feel a strong sense of shared responsibility for all students. That's one of my bellwether questions. It lets me know where they are because if the answer is we disagree, we're all in our own little pods and there's general ed and special ed and English language learners and Title I and so on, we've got some work to do. So it's, this survey is really helpful and it, it's uh, very simple to administer. And, and I think you'll find it um, really useful when you're charting your progress. One of the things that you have to do, and, and this one is kind of a tough one, this, this whole piece about common vo a vision and vocabulary. This is not only the role of the leader, the principal, the special ed director, the uh, curriculum instruction director, or the the superintendent, but it's every person's role inside that school to promote a clear expectation that we expect that to the greatest extent appropriate, uh, students with an IEP are going to be served in the general education classroom um, and particularly within the curriculum. I would visit the old phrase that we used to hear a lot and I've been thinking about it recently and so I put it on your checklist. 
look into this, the work that's been done around all means all. That means we consider everybody in their potential. We begin by thinking they could be served inside the general education classroom. One of the things that I've, I've added here is um, a line to remind everyone to use person first language. And one of your resources is this from um, the internet. Uh, and it's a really quick description about why and how we use respectful language. I, I, I would say that we've made a lot of progress in our schools today, but I still do hear, and perhaps you do too, the, the language that says, um, um, let's say a um, um, child that's, cog uh, well, see, I have to put it, I'm so trained, I always put person first. Um, and so you want to say a child with um, a learning disability and start, start saying the learning disabled student or the, the he's learning disabled and place those labels front and center. So the philosophy behind it is so perfect and it's really aligned with inclusion that it's person first, it is child first, it is what they need and what their opportunities suggest. So I think it's very helpful to bring this out and, and, and follow along with it. The, um, the other issue that I think is important is that we need to, to especially if you're gonna conduct that survey, to start planning meetings prior to the school year so that the principal can, can present information about your, your inclusion data. What is the percent of our students currently with an IEP who are spending 80% or more of their time inside our general education classrooms? And, and follow that on through the, the different metrics that we have for uh, implementation of inclusion. And then I would see um, setting early in the year the opportunity, whether you have PLCs or grade level or department level meetings, this is sort of a magic question. Ask every component group, however you designate them, to talk about what, what will need to be done at that grade level or within that department to illustrate um, the whole philosophy of shared responsibility for every learner. And that would probably get you very quickly to conversations about the paraeducator or the teacher should um, um, should not be uh, in the back of the room with one or two students doing something different, but they should be integrated into the classroom, for example. Those kinds of conversations are really rich. And then if that's the standard, how do we pull that off? What do we do? How do we plan instructionally for that? So it's an important thing to have a discussion. Here is a tool that uh, I've shared with the uh, folks in Virginia before, but I wanted to put it in this set session as well. Uh, there is a, a PowerPoint presentation. It just has about six or eight slides to it. And I wanted to highlight the two that I think are most relevant here. It was designed for a school leader to present uh, to the faculty. And then as part of that, to have a large group discussion around what are we doing well with equity and excellence? Or if you want to, substitute the word in inclusive practices. Where, what, where do we have work remaining to, to be accomplished? And then suggested strategies. It's really critical to bring the whole faculty into this. It does not work, as you know, if it's a team off to themselves planning and not periodically looping back in to bring in the full faculty. So this is a really important piece and your transparencies, your slides are already done for you. Now, this one is an example that I think uh, is very helpful. And that is that you put the state standard and the state average and then your own district or school average so that you're able to contrast per school year. You're looking at what standards should we meet where is everybody else in this uh, process and where are we? It's invaluable to have these metrics so that you can look at them and plot them so that you have baseline data and this will, the lower part of the chart so you can actually create uh, line graphs and you can see when you're going up and uh-oh, when you're not. Um, one of the things that we put in your packet uh, is something that we developed some time ago there are six different activities that you can use at the faculty level for bringing people together. Again, it's critical to have those honest conversations, those courageous conversations, and bring in the whole faculty periodically to discuss something that a lot of folks find um, difficult to discuss because there are attitudinal issues that are wrapped up in it. It's really critical to bring out everybody's 
uh, thoughts and, and concerns and, and um, questions that they have that need to be answered. And then I have to say, uh, it's really important that when you develop this action plan, be certain that it is part of your school improvement plan that you submit to the state. And so that you have that and you formalize those action steps. There are an awful lot of these practices here and I'm going to share one um, that I thought of <laughs> Uh, just last night, and, and it's an old strategy, and it was not written down in your materials, but I, I smiled when I thought about it. Uh, some years back, I did some national research on what were the effective strategies for school districts uh, across the country in implementing least restrictive environment requirement. And in visiting with several schools that were identified as really outstanding, it was interesting that for the most part, uh, they would they would find one way or another they would mention um, that they would pick a day a year, hopefully kind of early ish in the fall, where the general ed teachers would go and teach the special ed classes and vice versa. Now of course there is a problem of numbers, so it had to work out a particular way. You'd have to to look out carefully how you scheduled it. But that for a whole day, general ed teachers were teaching in a special ed classroom, the one that was down the hall and vice versa, so that it created open conversations with each other about children, about students, about their commonalities, about the goals that we have for these youngsters and a little bit more in-depth knowledge of the youngsters. And it was really fabulous to see, they all sh uh, showed me some evidence of the shift in attitudes toward inclusion on the basis of that kind of an activity. So. Uh, if that appeals to you, I'd encourage you to add that to your list of strategies. The, uh, this is a, a snapshot in your toolbox of um, one of those activities that I told you that you will be able to download. This is one that starts with just the belief systems so that you can have an opportunity to, to see how, where the belief system is for each of those for, within the faculty. And feel free to change any one of those items or all of them so they match your needs. Um, a th one thing that uh, I'm very close to, um, I took it on, geez, I guess about 10, eight or 10 years ago at least, maybe longer, um, of the uh, Inclusive Schools Network, Inclusive Schools Network, ISN. And it is, uh, you can find it easily. Here is a snapshot of our web, the web page, the landing page, I think you call it, on our website off to the right and then in the center and off to the left is is a poster that we're using this year every year the first week in december um, we celebrate around the world this is a worldwide commitment to inclusive schools week and this year because of covid and all the stressors and strains that we've seen in our schools we decided to capture a theme for our annual celebration that is uh, just the word rebuilding because we've lost a lot. We've lost a lot of connection with each other, with our students. We have, um, we had for a while lost opportunities for some of us for being more inclusive. And so note that the week of December 6th through the 10th is the week this year for 2021 and the theme being rebuilding and on our website are lots of activities that you can engage in. This is really critical part of this first component of a common vision and vocabulary for inclusive practices. This is a fabulous start. I will tell you that every country in the world uh, logs on and, and has some message or some pictures of progress or, or projects they've had in their schools and it is phenomenal. And I really encourage you to think about utilizing this, um, this theme this year as a way to perhaps kickstart some of your own activities and reinvigorate your, your commitment to inclusive practices. This is really could be a fantastic way to do that. So go to the website. There's a separate website for Inclusive Schools uh, Network and, um, and they have all the tools you're going to need to, to have your students participate. Elementary, middle, high school, all kinds of activities for various uh, levels of youngsters. So I think it's a great idea and it really is fun to look and see what the other countries uh, comment as well. There, many of them are doing extraordinarily well with inclusive practices. 
The other thing we're giving you is um, we had a little Q&A document on inclusive education, and you have this as a downloadable. And so you have uh, a number of tools uh, that you can call upon. Okay. This one is pretty straightforward. This is the second component, and it is the legislative and accountability standards. Uh, in other words, we have to be legal. We want to be excellent with our practices, but we also want to be able to meet those legal standards uh, as well. So what we have to remember, and the big idea here is that every child is a general education student. Some need other supports in order to be successful or additional supports in order to be successful. But the neighborhood school and the general ed classroom are the very first considerations for any student in order to meet these standards. So given that, this is a lot of words and I'm not going to read them to you, but I do think they're important for you to look at. What it's basically telling us here is that we need to have a data profile. It's very, very important. Have a data profile so that at a glance, you can look at uh, the data that you need. Now there's still some, this is qualitative. I mean, you can actually turn attitudes into quantitative, what percent said yes and what percent said no to some of these questions in blue. But it's also important to look at, when you look at the whole concept of inclusion, it's much broader than when you first think about just the percent of students spending time inside the general education classroom. It also speaks to the whole issue of youngsters who are identified to be serving time in an in-school suspension and out-of-school suspension to huge um, metrics that talk to us about inclusion and how we're practicing that in our schools. The discipline referral rates, um, performance on assessments, and be sure you disaggregate that all by, by race and gender and other relevant metrics that you have. So, I wanted to give you um, a little display that we've created for some of the schools we work with in that you can chart your percent. Let's say that you're not quite at 80% of your youngsters spend 80% of the day in the general ed class. Maybe you're at 60 something this August. And then in December, wouldn't it be great if when you plotted it, you had a plot line that went up and increased your uh, percentage of young time kids spend in the general ed class. Flip it, wouldn't it be great if you take your um, referral rates for our disciplinary um, issues and that you showed a decline over time. So you can use this handy little piece for anything that you want to measure, but I would see you having several of these around each of those metrics because there's nothing that motivates a team more than seeing where we really are on the scale and where we are now and where we want to be. And therefore, it just stimulates the, the commitment to action. And what's what we're talking about today, the action plan. Very simple. What I like is the bottom, where when you look at your data, you have a chance to say, well, um, what is our rationale for, why did that data change? Wow, well, we were really good this year. We've really polished up our multi-tiered system of supports or we've improved our tier one strategies or whatever, and then steps to accomplish future goals. So as you're seeing, all of this cycles right back uh, into that improvement plan or that action plan. So to me, this is one of the must-haves in your action plan that will really help guide your, your work and, and make it so much more, I think, in interesting and exciting when you see the progress that you make. All right. Here's another look at it. Um, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna brag on Virginia, Department of Education. I wish every state had um, such accessible data. This is a snapshot I took recently uh, off of your own state website. And all you do is click on all, any one of these links right here in terms of our indicators for performance uh, from our state and federal action plans or performance plans. And boom, you have the data at your fingertips are on the screen. What is also true if you scroll down here is that the data is also available linked by your own school district. And so you have statewide data and then you have your own lo local data. So what I just showed you is a very simple chart to complete in your state because you already have the data that you need to do it. So it's really, really, I think very impressive. 
And again, I would encourage you as you look at in, uh, inclusion to remember it's not just the indicator five. That inclusion in, is so reflected in your graduation rates, dropout rates, uh, student performance, expulsion, suspension. It's, it's so um, entwined with all of these other metrics that it'll be very, very powerful to be able to pull all of those numbers if you'd like. And so that you're really knowledgeable of what you're doing and how you're doing it and what your current success rate is. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you remember that the thought at the beginning of this was that we identify any students with that, with that we are looking at our, our compliance issues. Well, when you do that, you're going to be looking at the percentage of students that are on your campus that are their home campus. Remember the first standard was neighborhood school. So in your own school, do you have students that are served in another school in your district? Did you send one, two or three or 10 or 12 youngsters away from your own school to another school to receive services? And if so, who are those youngsters? So you want to identify who they are because one of the biggest, um, I think accomplishments of, of inclusion is that to be fully included, you're often, you're, you, you've got to consider being in your own neighborhood school. We have a number of children that uh, are bused uh, a long way, many, many minutes a day, back and forth, off of their, from their neighborhood school to another school to be served. So part of the inclusive practice uh, standards to us is that we are conscious of the students that we that are actually at another school and what would it take to identify the candidates to return back to your home school. Maybe you've developed the expertise, the competence, the, the um, uh, array of services that you would be able to bring these youngsters back on, on what I think a real inclusive school does is it looks to see who these youngsters are, what their needs are, and then part of your action plan is seeing how you develop strategies that would meet their needs effectively and appropriately in your own school. This is an important piece uh, in terms of it certainly impacts the family. And so one of the tasks under this one is that you, you clearly bring the parents into that conversation about return to the neighborhood school setting. But this is big work. This is critical work. This is a work, in my opinion, that really shifts the continuum. It really does embrace inclusive practices when you're consciously looking at the youngsters that are, are served elsewhere um, and what it would take to bring them back. So really do kind of put a star on that one. That's a really important strategy. One of the things that we find uh, when we go into schools that's important to do is when you do the, conduct that physical walkthrough and you look at the various environments in the school, you want to see what are um, um, the what are the physical locations for, for specialized support when a student with a disability is actually outside of the general education classroom. And we've given names to these places. We sometimes call them life skills or resource or the behavior pod or what have you. And we're, we're, we're working, as you know, in, in your inclusive world uh, toward leaving these labels behind and being much more student centered. But when you walk down that hall, are those locations identified by a label? Are they far away from their on grade level um, uh, peers? Where are they exactly? Where are they located? Are they located in a place that would not bring um, additional uh, stigma to the children who are served there. So this walkthrough is really important every year to, to consciously look around you um, and see. I know I actually still to this day am sometimes in a school that has a whole great big sign that says special education wing. Hmm. They need a, they need a, a school walkthrough, don't they? And so then make your adjustments as needed. This is a really critical piece. You might surprise yourself. One, how well you're doing, or oops, the one or two things you might not have noticed if you didn't do a conscious walkthrough to identify them. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time right here with these two forms. We're gonna pick this up in a minute. But as many of you know, in our firm, we've designed these two forms 
uh, and this really does come under the heading of legislative and, and, and legal standards, uh, to help schools child by child, student by student, make decisions about what would be the services that are required, what can be provided inside the general ed classroom, and what supports are needed in order to make that successful. So we'll talk about the, um, these two farms off to, the, off to your right, uh, both now and one more time when we look at instructional decision making. But the thing I want you to, to realize with this first form is this is really great because I mentioned earlier the youngsters that may not be on your school campus now <clears throat> are students that have a pretty high percentage of their time spent outside of the general education classroom. This is a phenomenal approach where you could put the goals for that student and say, here's the sequence of activities that are happening inside the general education uh, classroom at that grade level or for department. And then which of these goals could actually be met in the general education classroom? And which of those had we automatically decided, oh, well, the child has this label on the IEP. So he naturally has to go to resource for, for English language arts or for math. Let's challenge that assumption by using this kind of a, a general form where your instructions are to put a check wherever you see an opportunity for the student to meet that, that goal inside the general ed class. Again, we're gonna talk more detail in a more detailed level later, but then, then taking that same student, we're just working one student at a time, answering a series of instructional questions and then staffing questions that help us arrive at the appropriate supports. And when you do, when you do use this kind of a format, you know that you're starting with the general education classroom and moving beyond it only to the extent that it's necessary for the needs of the student. Not adult preference or available services, but exactly what that student needs. And one promise I, I will make you, if you, if you, um, when you, and I know you will, uh, commit to this kind of a planning, one of the things that is exciting to me is that youngsters achieve their IEP goals much more rapidly because they've been the focus of what is required in order for them to achieve those goals. And you will see stronger, better, more rapid progress as a result. So we really urge you to have some kind of student-centered way of looking at services instead of looking at the label or ratios or what other um, mechanism other schools have used before we really became focused on inclusion. At least twice annually, I think, we need to look at the percentage of students that are served in our school with, uh, and identified as having an, um, an, um, a disability and therefore an IEP. The reason for that is the national statistic is um, somewhere between, well, I'd say, well, eight to eight to twelve percent is a range. If you go lower than that or higher than that, all you want to do is be sure that you're you're monitoring that and making certain that you've made the right decisions and that you made them on the basis of student needs. There is no prescribed percentage anywhere that says this is exactly the percentage of ch children that should have in your school should have an IEP. But when you see that percentage creeping up, as we do see in some of our schools, it goes to 14% and 15% and 16 and 17%, then we really know that we have to really double down on our look at how we're serving kids and the philosophy behind it. So I think it's an important metric. It's just that you're never going to hear me give you an absolute percentage that it should be because it has to be student-centered. It has to be determined by the needs of the students. So we just say if it's, if it's more than or less than 2% of the state average, then you might want to really look at the processes and the reasons for that. And you might want to dust off your multi-tiered system of supports, which has, oh, it's, there, it's really, really important to, to focus on, on our systems for intervening early and intervening effectively when a student begins to experience difficulty. Instead of you've heard that phrase, I have all my career, wait, or wait to fail. We don't want to do that. So we want to intervene early so that perhaps a child does not need a label. 
or special education. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the previous discussion has been around the legal standards, and there are a number of them, and you have them on your state um, website, and you have wonderful data to track it. It's really important to know where you are and where you stand with that. Now, this next third component is really, really important. And, and I will tell you that it's something we added in the last three years, two to three years. And it, and it goes along with my emphasis on the multi-tiered system of support or response to intervention or whatever you call it at your school, uh, your district. And it talks about the services first that every child should have in order to be successful in school. And that was the tier one strategies that every child should have. And so one of the things that reasons that we added to this um, entire um, component here is that we began noticing that often, sadly and truly, inside the general education classroom, those basic fundamental or foundational strategies are not in place. And so it's more likely the child would need to be referred for additional services to support them because the foundational general education services are missing, are not fully adequate. So we do need to think what are the tier one strategies that we should see. So in your action plan, uh, one of the things that we believe very strongly is that we should ask our teachers to investigate and present sessions on differentiated instruction. Here are some of the components of, um, of, of really good tier one instruction. Flexible grouping, um, should it be one what, a whole group instruction every, all day, every day? Think about how often you see that. Instead of flexible grouping, cooperative grouping, grouping by reading level, grouping by interest, throughout the day having different mechanisms for grouping children. Pre-assessing. Before we launch into teaching a um, unit, it's important to say what do our kids know? What do they want to know? What are they interested in? How do they think they will use this information? Because I can tap into student engagement strategies. Now, scaffolding and accommodations, very, very important um, pieces of our instructional delivery. And I'm going to give you some tools for this in, a, in just a few minutes. But this, the uh, opportunity to have uh, accommodations in place that we have then, if we found a, a youngster, any child can have an accommodation. It does not mean we're changing what the student is learning. It means we're maybe adding or augmenting the way the student learns. You're familiar with the term universal design for instruction or UDL, universal design for learning. Scaffolds, I personally am very visual learner. I would, uh, I would hate to think where I would be if my teachers hadn't recognized that and then I didn't have graphic organizers and chapter outlines and, and manip manipulatives to use in my learning. So it's important to realize that most every child needs some level of scaffolding, at least even to master the initial concept. And then they can pile on additional learning on top of that after it's made sense to them. But most kids need some level of, of support in their learning. Uh, student engagement, we've mentioned. Um, we've got to pay attention to their engagement. What I say is, when you see that a child isn't engaged, and we happen to see that frequently in our classrooms, then boom, stop. How long does that student stay disengaged? And what does the teacher do in order to re-engage him in the learning? Here's one that, that all of you know, that if it's missing in a classroom, may actually result in referrals for um, consideration for special education. And that is without really solid, good classroom management techniques, positive behavioral supports. Without those, we may have some youngsters who needed more structure, needed those behaviors, positive behaviors identified, needed to be explicitly taught in them and have, re have them reinforced. So this is a really clear path if they're not present in the general ed class to a referral for behavior issues. And then finally, one of our favorite strategies is multi-level instruction. Let's don't be afraid to design a, a strong, solid lesson that is on target, on grade level, standards-based, with a great deal of rigor. 
and then see what, how can we adjust it through any one of these approaches or scaffolding or accommodations so that every child can acquire the knowledge of that lesson. But also recognize that for some of our youngsters who have an IEP, we may have to have an alternative objective in mind. Maybe within that on grade level content, there is another objective that's not quite on grade level, but it's where that child is performing at this time that gives them a ladder to the general curriculum and enables them to stay in the general ed classroom, to learn um, within the context of an on grade level lesson, but to have their needs adjusted as well. Look into multi-level instruction, originally designed for kids who were identified as gifted because it enabled the teacher to to strengthen or water up the curriculum <clears throat> rather than just water down. Um, the um, a tool that we've given you for strong tier one instruction is this one, a differentiated instruction planning tool where you have your learner objective, you have your strategies for delivering the instruction or pre presenting it, teaching it. Um, perhaps you're gonna do a differentiated lecture for the first 10 minutes, it's whole group. Then you're going to break them into um, interest groups. So it will be small group by interest in terms of, let's say, future career choices or, or um, application in the neighborhood or however you want to, to, to divide it. And then how you're going to assess. And then for those students who need something different, and it could be the child who has already mastered the content or one that's not quite there yet, what is it we need to do in order to support them? Again, we're going to, if you see, can the student participate as designed? If yes, stop right there. And the better the design, the more often the answer is yes. But if not, whoops, do we have those tier one strategies in place? Or is everybody getting the exact same lesson in exact same way at the exact same time? Then we'll be able to say, if, not, if that's not sufficient, would an accommodation support? And then if not a modification and is there technology that's needed, or behavior supports, or personal supports? We're going to get into those last several questions uh, a little bit more detailed in just a few minutes. So, what do we do to be sure that we have solid Tier 1 instruction? Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that, that I think every school district has got to have a plan in place for their professional development so that every teacher in the district is knowledgeable of those strategies or, or others more. Whatever is research-based and considered um, uh, <clears throat> solid tier one instructional strategy should be part of your professional development plan. So when you have, um, you've got to have that flexible staff development. Think back where I had that list a minute ago of differentiated instruction, multi-level instruction scaffolds. Think back on that list. And then think about how you can embed various flexible professional development options. You know, um, I love a, a, a great professional development session where, where the presenter can interact directly with the audience and, and sit at the tables with them as they problem solve. I love that and I miss some of that. I've been doing less of it recently. But I will encourage you to think about, I think that we need to build a professional development library. And that might mean online courses as well. Maybe some of it, such as this one, that's uh, the webinars that are, are videoed and you can play back at another time. Um, embed training in a, a teacher's uh, co conference period or planning period uh, periodically. You can't overdo that because our teachers need their planning time. But that would be an, a, a perfect way. Or teacher as expert sessions where teachers divide up the content and bring it back to, to share with others. Um, one of the things that we have for you is um, an, an observation tool for tier one instructional strategies. And so we recommend that you use that, that you walk through the classrooms and you can have a teacher group, you can have the principal and a teacher group, you can have just the instructional leader in your, in your school or your curriculum consultants come in and observe so that they give you, not reported by teacher necessarily, but simply by the whole building, where are we with regard to the use of those tier one strategies? Are they in place and are they used appropriately? Really constructive feedback for every teacher. So here is an example of one that we've put that you can download. Um, that describes, um, for example, let's see, 
um, here's uh, instructional activities and use of academic learning time. Are our teachers really using their academic learning time well? And um, are they minimizing interruptions? Uh, you can read through this list, but I like it because this actually is a pretty cool outline for professional development or for a teacher to read this and learn more about that strategy of use, use of academic learning time. So it doesn't always have to be a formal sit and get kind of session, but also do we have, do we give teachers access to, to knowledge about those strategies? And then do we have a way to, to say, are they in place or are they not in our classrooms? So with that in mind, you train teachers to use that observation tool or something similar and provide maybe pairs of teachers to have a chance to walk through the classrooms and observe. And, and in some cases, and we've said it here in our strategy, when teachers do teacher to teacher observation, maybe uh, a better way to do that is to allow only positive feedback about what they've seen. Uh, so that, that um, it's not a gotcha session, but it's one that highlights uh, the good strategies that are in place. Another uh, tool that we have for you is an accommodations audit form. And this is, I love it. Um, you go, before you go into a general, ed, a general ed classroom or a special ed classroom, you uh, pull out the IEP and look to see what accommodations we have specified for the individual student and the individual subjects. And then we go in and make a determination of whether or not those are in place. Hugely important, really important, because if, we're, if it's something is important enough to write in the IEP, then we're legally required to provide it. And if we don't, then the student is, would be like taking away someone's glasses, uh, who needs glasses in order to read. It's the exact same thing. So that's how important it is. Another is to be sure those positive behavioral supports are in place. This is huge. Uh, I like school-wide positive behavioral support, so it's not just teacher to teacher and one classroom to another, but that's in fact is, um, is, is, is really systemic throughout the school. Where do we get in trouble when kids change classes in the middle school? Uh, what are the behaviors that we need to, to insist on when they uh, go down the hall and change classes? What instruction do we need to give them? What explicit instruction do we need to give them? And then um, we need to analyze our discipline data so that we, ca we can capture trends. Um, sometimes we find that it is only one or two teachers that are contributing to high referral rates for disciplinary action. So really, again, digging down into your data and digging down into your practice. Now I'm going to uh, pause here a minute. I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to um, see that I, all I see is little names on here. I don't really see faces, I don't think. Uh, but I wanted to stop now and give you a chance to, um, okay, and gives me a chance to read the questions that you have off to the side. And, um, and it, uh, here's one. Um, I'm interested in how to incorporate this into an IEP. We always note that case managers will consult with the supervisors of extracurricular activities to ensure participation. Oh, wait, was that the last session? Uh-oh. <laughs> In terms of IEP documentation. Um, yep, no, I borrowed a question from the last I think last all those session. questions were for the last session. They were, they were. Okay, everybody, um, does anybody have a question? Let me pause right now. Does anybody have a question about what I presented so far? Anyone? Just unmute and ask. Okay. Great. All right. All right, well, let's continue then. I'm gonna assume that you have such a great instructor that you have no questions. <laughs> oh, okay, now, Let's go back then to screen share and let's see, back to our slides. There, okay. Now, the fourth of the 10 um, components that we're going to talk about today is uh, described as student-centered decisions related to staffing and scheduling. Now, this is where a lot of people want to begin. They want to begin 
with this, the staffing and scheduling. So how many staff will I need? How will we schedule it? And so on. Well, one of the things that when we put student-centered decisions in the front, that means we have to look at the needs of the students. And so um, the main thought here is the one main thing is the student. Um, I'll tell you a, a, a trick, I think, or a secret or a process I use. If I really want to look at a school's inclusive practices and where they are in terms of their, their performance and, and the extent to which they are inclusive, if a school is really student-centered about everything, what that student needs in order to be successful, how we can adjust our own world so that that youngster could be more included and so on, then that's an inclusive school. It's really, uh, I think it comes down to that. So this section is going to be very important in that it is going to, well, I think it goes across every one of the components we're going to talk about. All right. Now I mentioned earlier and I showed you forms one and two, and I said we would be talking about them more fully later. And one of the things that I have to say is that it's not appropriate that the special ed teacher goes off in a closet and, and completes those forms. It really must be done collaboratively. There are things that the general ed teacher knows that we don't know and vice versa. And coming together, it's a much richer and more um, effective IEP process. The forms one and two, are, as we'll review again, are going to give us the needs for an individual student in terms of services and the way we deliver instruction. And, and what kind of staffing may, or may be needed throughout the day. In some cases, the student doesn't require any additional staff for the, for the social studies class, as long as they have their text-to-speech uh, materials available. And in another classroom, there needs to be an adult, whether it's a paraeducator, a certified teacher, uh, or whatever you decide, a related service personnel, to help provide that support inside the classroom. So I'm going to show you in just a minute that when you finished form one and forms one and two, you have the information you need in order to build your school schedule. So you need to have somebody in leadership position that maintains a spreadsheet that you're going to develop that will show you what schedule you should place in your school that really aligns those resources, in other words, people, to the right classroom at the right time to, to address the needs of students. So I whizzed past them a while ago, and now I would like to go back to um, the sequence of, of seven easy questions. Anybody can learn these in, in a hurry. This is something I would work on. If I had an action plan for my school, I would want this to be a poster. I'd want to put it in my, where my team's plan. I'd want to put it in the room where we typically meet for the IEP development or the IEP meetings. I would want this to be um, 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 just a simple set of questions that everyone in my school understands the sequence of and why they're important. So, as we very briefly mentioned earlier, the first question is, can the student participate as designed? Yes or no. Again, the better I am as a teacher in designing really interesting, engaging lessons that are activity-based, the more often my answer is yes. If I'm not, then every time the answer is no, the student can't participate as designed. Well, it means it's a bad design. Let's go back and look. Because for many of our students, a, a good design of instruction should enable them to be successful in the classroom. Then the next question is, um, not if, if, if no, not as designed, oh, are there missing tier one strategies in place? Don't we have, if there's a behavior flare up, do we have positive behavioral supports in the classroom? Are we using multi-level instruction? Are we differentiating instruction? Are we using flexible groups? Those kinds of questions that we just reviewed in the previous component fit in right there into that little line of tier one in place. When we know it is in place, then does the student require something additional, like an accommodation, a change not in what they're learning, but how they're learning it. So we have a variety of accommodations. We have, a, we have hundreds of different accommodations 
that I would recommend be one of the first things that every school does at the beginning of the year, and this can be an action step that you add. Um, it's not in the, the written list, but I would, I would add it off to the side. And that would be that every grade level and every, every subject area spend a couple of meetings at the beginning of the school year identifying the scaffolds or the accommodations that may be very helpful for all kids or just a few students as you go through the, 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 the units so that they're all able to participate fully. Now, we draw a real strong dark line between accommodations question and the modifications question. Really often, a good accommodation will keep us from having to drop down to that next line and modify the content because we don't want to change what the student is learning if or, and, and lower the content standard unless um, uh, accommodation is simply not sufficient. So you know the students that we're talking about, the one that, that you serve in your schools, uh, a student who can actually participate inside the general ed classroom, but may have to have a different learner expectation or outcome for an, in, uh, for an instructional activity. Now, these are pretty important questions as well. Is, an assistive to, is assistive technology required? Are there behavioral supports that are needed for that student? And finally, the last question we ask is, is personal support required? One, to provide any of the services above, or do we need that person in the classroom closer proximity to the student? so that they are actively engaged in either collaborative teaching or support facilitation or uh, any one of our models of delivering instruction with the general ed and special ed teacher partnering. So this little list right here, it's designed so that you can print it out as a poster, is critical because I call it my keep myself honest <laughs> set of, of strategies. Because if I follow this, I know I'm maintaining an inclusive setting or in set of decisions for my youngsters. So here again is Farm 1. Remember, you check where there are opportunities to address instructional goals in the general ed class. And now here, this is where we're going to spend a little bit more time. Look at this. This is per subject. This is for the student, per subject, and IEP goal if you wish, what kinds of supports are needed and it has the questions all along this continuum. And here, the first part of that are the instructional supports, and the second part are the personal supports or the staffing that might need to be provided. A caution I would give us all is that we don't want, don't assume that staff is needed for every part of the student's instructional day, because it likely is not. So let's look at opportunities to gain more and more independence, if it's appropriate, so that you wouldn't check a person out to the side for, let's say, social studies, as I mentioned earlier, because we already have, under accommodation, say, the text-to-speech option for the student so they can listen to the chapters instead of having to read at a higher grade level than they're accustomed to. Later on, we may have to have a staff member in Algebra two because of the level of content or the level of interaction the student needs with a teacher uh, that is more than would generally be expected for a general ed teacher in a, in a whole classroom. So this is a very powerful topic. Um, uh, um, I would call it a decision guide, and it really does feed right into your IEP. Now, from that list, which is all individual student-centered, so they were all by name, then, for each of the students that we have completed that process, what grade levels are they in? What support, if any, did they need during reading, math, science, social studies, whatever? And then you're able to say support facilitation three times a week, or let's see, we have co-teaching for um, Alice Kelly is going to have co-teaching in reading and language arts. And so is Thomas Stan uh, Staley in uh, math and science. So here you have what kind of support is needed in what grade level for which students. And ta-da, what it gives you is, it gives you a list of the students who are going to need co-teaching, let's say in Algebra 1, the students who are going to need support um, um, in advanced support for, um, for English, 
In other words, that the accommodations we prepared in, in advance of instruction and so on. So here are the codes down at the bottom for those levels of support, i.e. a person. And then when you finish, you can step back and you can see what adults are needed where, when, and to do what. So you always have a very student-based calendar or master schedule. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, you're going to want to set a date in the spring where you complete Forms 1, 2, and 3 so that you have a draft proposed schedule of services for the coming school year. And then you want to have that in place before you do you complete the master schedule. If you do the <clears throat> pardon me, master schedule first, <coughs> pardon me, the master schedule first, and then try to fit in the very, very critical individual student needs, it just simply doesn't work. So remember to do the, have the student-centered one first and then your master schedule. And so those are critical action steps to recommend. Now, the, um, I believe I, I'm going to go back some way here because, ah, I did, all right. So let's pause here a minute and say, this is really the heavy work, in my opinion, to be in a really inclusive school. Forms one, two, and three are a process that you have that looks at what the students need, specifically when they need it, and what level of support, and then you create your master schedule from that. Okay, I suspected as much, and that was true. I clicked so fast that I clicked right past the um, category of, of issue that we want to talk about now. This is component number five. One of the things that we see when we visit schools is, very often is everybody's working really hard. We're all working hard. We're all busy. We've got a schedule. Everybody's doing what they need to be doing pretty much, except that without what we just completed, that last discussion piece about a really good stretch schedule that's based on those student needs, we may be doing some things that aren't needed or are not where we are needed most. So we've got to really look at how effectively are we using our resources. In addition, my opinion is my theory after way many more years than I care to tell you, we really could do more with what we currently have. We are not making sure in many cases that we're really using our resources effectively and efficiently. And I'm gonna give you my two top contenders around that. One, in terms of action steps, we need to be sure that we effectively use staff that they're very clear about their roles. Role clarity is huge. Does everyone in the school know and understand the role of that individual? So when we select new personnel, the first step is to ask questions in your interviews that get at their own attitudes about inclusive practices. What do you do, for example, teacher A, in your classrooms, um, what would you do if we, if you became part of our faculty that would promote our mission toward inclusive practices? Ask specific questions of individuals who are interviewing for positions in your school so that you understand that you know that if you have a person applying that is not really in sync with the inclusive education commitment that we're all, we all feel across the country then you know it up in advance and then you're not going to have the attitudinal shift concerns throughout the next school year that you could have done without. The, um, the next is, are we clearly defining the roles of various positions? And, and this line, the second bullet here, it relates to paraeducators. The, the things that go wrong with our paraeducators are we often hire them then we don't include them in our professional development training and they really need it. Because in the past, you'll recall that we used primarily paraeducators for roles that were more physical support, like toileting, feeding, uh, movement, support to the occupational therapist or the physical therapist. And within the last couple of decades, especially with the advance of inclusive practices, we are using our paraeducators more and more in academic support roles as well. And therefore, 
because they're not typically having, don't ha typically have a degree from a college or university, but have a minim at minimum a high school degree, then we have a gap to close in terms of their own knowledge about how to support our youngsters academically. So there needs to be clear roles. Uh, for example, in most states, the rule is that a paraeducator cannot deliver initial instruction to a student regarding the, the key concepts of a lesson, that that should be a certified teacher who does that. Well, are we following that rule? Are we also providing the professional development that the paras need for their expanded role in instructional support? And then really importantly, one of the things we've got to be careful to do is provide training for the teachers who supervise those paraeducators to know that they're responsible for creating those paraeducator schedules, for making sure they know how to implement those schedules and, and, and uh, are really comfortable in their roles and they know when they need to ask for assistance. You need to, in a survey, and I think the one that we've given you has a question that gets at this, to be sure that all special ed staff have the materials they need. This is actually becoming an older question. Some years back, it was huge because many of our special ed teachers did not possess and they did not have at their desk the teacher, teacher editions for the textbooks that they were expected to teach from. And they, there was a shortage. The principal allocated them to the on grade level or department level te teachers. And many times a special ed teacher didn't have those. Today, most of our correct curriculum materials and teacher materials are available to us online. So that's less necessary to probe that, but it's still important to be sure that everyone understands that the general curriculum is the appropriate framework to teach every student, regardless of whether or not they have an IEP or not. And so we've got to integrate on grade level standards-based materials and textbooks and the same material wherever possible that are used in the general education classroom. So we need to be careful that they are in fact accessible to all teachers. One of the things that you need to do is uh, have the teachers identify as well as the paras, the ongoing training needs they have. We need to um, uh, also be careful and work on guidelines if we have a high percentage of our students with an IEP also has a one-on-one -on -one paraeducator, that's generally a problem. We're actually using adult proximity to teach a child rather than really good teaching skills and see our, our behavior management skills. So we have to be very careful. If we're overusing one-on-one -on -one paras, there are detrimental re effects of that. And we have an article for you that's perfect that's old, it's old now, but it is, I've not seen one that matches it. It's just phenomenal to help you even design your professional development for paraeducators and their teachers. Uh, be sure you have a collaborative calendar to be certain that every single person who's working with a child with an IEP, a special ed teacher has collaborative planning time with the requisite appropriate general education teacher or team. It's really essential that they have that, otherwise, we are, are flying by the seat of our pants, as an old expression used to go, and it doesn't, it's not effective for the students and it's, not, it's very frustrating for the adults. So let's make sure that we have a collaboration calendar that accounts for that for every single teacher. One of the groups that's often left out, and I'm gonna use an old word here, but you know, when the child is in specialized support, receiving that support outside of the general ed class, we frequently leave out the specialized support teachers from good professional development around the curriculum and uh, opportunities for planning with their, their same, um, the, the, their colleagues that teach the same subjects. Because when you're working with a population of youngsters who are typically not working on grade level, for example, then you've got to have work with the general ed teachers who can give you a framework of where youngsters should be at this age and this grade level so that you're finding ways to accelerate instruction instead of using some old remedial instruction techniques. So here is that article I mentioned, uh, Michael Gian Greco, Be Careful What You Wish For, Five Reasons to Be Concerned About the Assignment of Individual Paras. It is a fabulous article. Um, I, I couldn't say to enough about it. It talks about the pitfalls of having a paraeducator assigned to the side of a student and the losses that can be 
uh, would, would be um, realized by doing such a thing and how important it is when they are needed, of course, they should be there. But if it happens to be the fad of the day that everyone's child gets their own paraeducator, <clears throat> then we've, we've really got to rein in that decision-making process so it really relates to what the student needs and, and not, um, not maybe responding to adult wishes instead. Um, another thing we put in your packet is a pretty handy um, list of responsibilities that can the teacher and the paraeducator can discuss together. Uh, here are various responsibilities. Is this a daily responsibility, weekly, monthly? Never. There may be something, some things on this list that the teacher says, I read that's not something that, that I would have you do. That's not, that's, that's not for you, that's not your role. Which is good news for the paraeducator since there's so much that they can do. And then, um, and then when, when is it requested by the teacher or the administrator is there a professional development that's needed? And so you would jot that down. So here's the responsibilities. Is there training that's needed in order to be successful in delivering that service? <clears throat> now, the sixth uh, of our topics is really critical and I call it inclusion is for adults too because you have to plan together in order to succeed together. Um, it's, it's absolutely essential. And for many years, teaching was a fairly lonely uh, profession. You went in your classroom, you closed the door, you had your planning period, you planned your lessons, and then you uh, proceeded to teach your youngsters. And we all know that's been gone for a very long time. Yet, I'm gonna challenge you in this section to really talk among yourselves about what it would take to achieve truly authentic collaboration so that you're truly working together across all the tasks that are involved in, in, uh, in schooling for children. Are we really working together? Are, have we put up barriers? Have we put up territory? This is your territory and this is mine. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the action steps that we recommend here. You know, sometimes <clears throat> we think it comes naturally, but sometimes collaboration um, needs to be taught. What kind of questions do we need to ask? How often do we, how do we need to, to proceed in our planning? Uh, uh, we often share this, and if you've heard me say it before, I'll just say it again. One of the things that's really important is that um, we had a, um, to remember is it doesn't have to be a lot of questions. It could be just a few. Uh, one of our former colleagues that had said that there were three questions that he told his teachers when you get together, here's the questions I hope you answer. One, what are we teaching? Two, who's doing what? What are our various roles? And three, are there any students that in our class right now that are going to need some assistance in, um, uh, in, 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 um, in working together or are, are, are actually achieving success. So if there are kids that need help, then what do we need to do in order to make that happen? And it shouldn't always be the special ed teacher doing the providing the help piece, but it should be, um, it should be um, a shared role. All right, um, periodic observations. I'm gonna show you in just a minute an observation guide. Create a, uh, the, there it is, that school collaborative calendar. Um, use that survey from um, option one for component one that we gave you has a number of questions related to the quality of collaboration as seen from the teacher or paraeducator's point of view. So that's important to get that information. And then here are a couple of tools for you that describe um, different approaches for co-teaching versus support facilitation. Now, you know and you recognize the, the left-hand column are the strategies from Marilyn Friend. Dr. Marilyn Friend's strategies are approaches for, for two adults sharing the same classroom and the strengths and the drawbacks for each one. Um, the <clears throat> thing that we would also say is, um, and I'm going to define it again, co support facilitation would be when the support is uh, for two teachers to be in the same classroom is not needed actually every day, Monday through Friday, but may need, be needed uh, two days a week or three days a week. Um, so that, but it's planned for, it's habitual, it is routine, 
But we know that when we get into more of our small group activities on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, that's when we need the co the, the, the teacher. And so it's not co-teaching, because co means every day for us. So it would be support facilitation. Um, there are some tools in your packet for our initial planning considerations. How do we build that, that partnership? How do we make sure that we're using our time together well? Um, and how are we sure that we're making we're meeting the needs of students? So there's some excellent questions in this little piece right here. How are we going to communicate with parents? Um, how are we going to arrange our classrooms so that it really fits for two adults uh, and, and our, our 28 kids, our 24 kids? Um, and how are we going to how are we going to plan our content? And how are we going to group our youngsters? So a number of those different options as well. Okay, so here are a further uh, now this one is really important. This first one on the on the left here, interpersonal dynamics. This is a discussion of core beliefs. It's really critical when you're collaboratively teaching with one another. Now this one to the right is really great. It is a uh, an observation tool and a question answer tool, whether you observe it or then the teachers say yes or no to the questions below. Is this partnership seamless? Is it respectful? Is it effective? And is it equitable? So when you go into the classroom, now let's talk, let's turn, translate this into action steps. Action steps. Prior, hopefully, to the, to the beginning of instruction every year, the teachers who are assigned to be co-teaching or providing support facilitation will in fact complete these kinds of forms here so that they know each other well and know how they're going to approach their assignment for the year. Another action step, that after the third week of school on a monthly or quarterly basis, that there will be pairs of teachers who will conduct the observations of each of the collaboratively taught or support facilitated classrooms to monitor the kinds of behaviors that we want to see in the classroom. And are they moving up to really proficient level? Are they still struggling at some of the very basics of collaborative teaching? So these are action steps to utilize these formats and to utilize this observation protocol. Uh, the principal with, uh, can use this um, by him or herself, or we can have trained pairs of teachers utilize the, the, the checklist. We can have the, their own teachers that um, let's say Marcy and I are co-teaching Algebra One, we can fill this out ourselves once every quarter and say, how are we doing? And is there, is there any way that we need to, to uh, improve our practice? There's some difficult questions here. Sometimes that second teacher is not in the class as scheduled and that causes real problems. Where are you? Why are you not here? And we've got to rearrange the schedules for IEPs or other things that pull you away so that you're really accessible to this classroom as designed. So there's some difficult conversations that you can have within this one sheet of paper that then improve your practice. <clears throat> one of the things that um, we need to, to pay close attention to, and I need to pay close attention to the time, is these is the improvement of specialized support. While we're off being very careful to improve inclusive practices, we've also got to be careful that we are really delivering solid instruction to those youngsters when they go down the hall to specialized support. And again, there's an observation tool for that, uh, the, the collaborative time they need to spend, and we have some quality standards for that group. This is very helpful for our teachers and our principals to look at what should that specialized support classroom look like and what standards should be in place? For example, we need to have an emphasis on, um, um, a, on a participation and progress in the general curriculum. No little, little worksheets and, and puzzle time and, and so on. It's got to be really very, very um, focused on the instructional content uh, for, for most of the instructional day. And here again is a matching observation tool. Now, Dr. Lucas, I tuned in for part of his session, very instructive, helpful, is to understand that social inclusion has got to be purposeful. It doesn't just happen. It has got to be purposeful. And we've got to think about how we engage youngsters and provide 
um, a meaningful social opportunities. It's a shame to think of inclusion both academically and physically, but not to think of social inclusion because that's one of the main uh, advantages and objectives, not the main, not the only, but it's a very important one so that they have social life among their peers. So do we use peer supports in our school? Do we talk to our PLCs about social inclusion? The list that um, Dr. Lucas gave you is perfect to just plop right into this set of tools because those are the op some of the great options that you have for, for focusing on social inclusion. One of the things I would put, a, put a, an emphasis on here that I learned in my work with the Special Olympics group out of Washington, DC, is that we shouldn't just have youngsters with disabilities participate, but we've got to find ways for them to have leadership roles in some of their school uh, practices. Um, leadership role in planning the prom or planning the football dinner at, for the football players after the game or what have you, so that they're, um, they're in also given opportunities for leadership, a really critical piece. Another piece that we wanna talk about very quickly is the family and community engagement. Really important, they are our most important partners. And what I think, if I would just summarize this piece here, is that very often we possess information that we really ought to be sharing with families. Have we presented a, the, a, a session on inclusion for our parents? Have we asked our special ed team to identify discussion topics for our parents and our community so that we can talk about inclusion and, and have power hours for parents to present to each other? And if you have an, a newsletter, Analyze how often do you put in success stories about youngsters and their with an IP and their involvement really critical pieces there and finally and this is actually pretty well handled in the materials the tool that we've given you be careful that we don't do all this work for inclusive schools and look one day and see that that staff development we did was three years ago that the PLC conversations about inclusion we stopped having last year and we didn't sustain all of that hard work that we put into it. So we need to preserve the progress. So finally, in your materials, that I believe should be action steps is to develop um, an annual review of sustainability practices in place. Are these in place so that we can sustain that practice over time? Are we um, linking inclusion to the other key priorities in a district? Do we annually celebrate the successes? Remember, Inclusive Schools Week, first week in December, uh, that's a good option. Uh, you're looking at your data pieces. In other words, this section right here pulls together a lot of the action steps that have been relevant for other components as well. So do we orient new faculty to inclusion and, and the way that we want to see it in our schools and the standards that we've set? Do we ask for status reports each year? for our PLCs at the end about what we've accomplished with regard to inclusion. So in closing, one of the things I hope you all realize is that this is really magnificent work. Work in inclusion is work of the head, but it's work of the heart. It is really touching people in ways that you may never know. And I know you know that because as educators, you have people come up to you and say that same thing. So. I love Mark Twain, I'll end with this. Continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. <laughs> and you know, be good to yourselves. Realize that this is not a small undertaking and, and really create those robust action plans around some of these steps and some that you think of for yourselves. And thank you for your time and attention today and good luck with your inclusive, rebuilding inclusive practices for the next school year. Thank you, Dr. Stutson.